been doing a series called Not Guilty. Two Sundays in a row now. Not, not in a row, but two Sundays in a row for me. I've been doing the series called Not Guilty. Now, I don't know about you, but it's changing my life. And it's changing how I think. It's really getting deep into me. And it's doing a powerful thing in me. And I've been talking basically about the fact that we're not to have a, a guilty conscience. We're to have a clear conscience, and we cannot manifest the glory of God effectively unless we have a clear conscience. And the blood of Jesus was shed to clear our conscience to, and to purge it. Amen? And so I, I'm not going to go back and re-preach stuff, but we've got both copies on CD from the last two Sunday mornings that I preached that. But I'm going to get back into it tonight, okay? I want to talk about it again tonight, and I'm going to talk about it one more time again this Sunday morning as well. But I want to ask you a question tonight just to set the, the tone for what I want to teach on tonight, okay? The question is, and, and you don't have to answer, I don't care if you do, but it's really it's rhetorical. I mean, you can answer if you want, but you might feel silly if you find out you were wrong in 20 minutes. <laughs> the question is, do we have a sinful nature? That's the question that I want to ask. Do we have a sinful nature? <laughs> and... Uh, Okay, now here's a couple of verses that I want to share with you. So let's just get into this. Let's teach tonight. Everybody grab a Bible. Be ready to do some reading for me tonight around the room in different places, all right? And I want to share some stuff with you here and get back into this one more time tonight, all right? Here's two verses that seem to contradict each other just a little bit, and that's what I want to look about because we, we sort of killed a sacred cow on Sunday morning, right? We talked about um, what confessing is all about, and it's not that we confess our sins in the new covenant, we just confess Jesus as Lord, and we believe in Him, and that's what sets us free. And I want to deal with another one tonight for a little bit, um, Colossians 2 verse 11, Colossians 2 and 11, and, it, and, and I want to deal with some scriptures because one thing that I like about having, I'm not trying to embarrass Brad and Beth, okay, but I'll, let me just highlight a couple of things. Them living with us right now, well, they, they just moved out here recently, and they're getting jobs, getting their feet on the ground, they joined the church, amen, and we're excited about that. <laughs> um, but we get to sit around and talk with them because they're, they're genuine baby Christians, and, and I love that, amen. And the, I, they sit around and we talk together and they ask us questions about the Bible and they ask us questions about things that have stumped them in years gone by when they get into scripture. And how many of you would just say, hey, Pastor Mark, there have been verses that have tripped me up for years too. Right, right. There has been, right? And so we want to we want to look at that because I don't think we're supposed to be confused about scripture at all. Right, right. And I, I think it's just misinformation or um, wrong theology or incomplete information that has tripped us up over the years. And so we want to deal with this, okay? Uh, Colossians 2.11 says, In him you also were circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Pretty much. Uh, Look at Romans 7.25. Romans 7.25. says, so then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Now, do you see a problem here between these two verses? Colossians 2.11 says that we've put off the sinful nature. It was cut off by Christ, okay? Not the hands of men, but the circumcision done by Christ. He's talking about the work on the cross, okay? Cut off our old nature. In Romans 7 it says that we are a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. So, um, in the second verse, he said, first time, first verse, he says, we don't have a sinful nature. Second verse, it acts like we do have one. All right, so which is it? Do we have a sinful nature or not? So, when you run across something like this in Scripture, what do you do? You get more Scripture. Right. You keep studying, and you take it into the whole of the context of, of, of Scripture, right? Line up on line, precept upon precept. So, let's get some more verses. Galatians 5 and 24. I'll move a little quick because I want to be respectful of the, the fact that it, I don't want it to get too late tonight being a midweek service. Galatians 5 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus 
have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Okay, good. So the sinful nature is gone, right? It's gone. That's a relief. But Romans 13 and 14, though, it goes on and says this, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. <laughs> now, now, wait a second. <laughs> I thought the sinful nature was gone. And now it's talking about it here again in, in Romans 13 and 14. So how can I gratify the desires of a sinful nature if it's gone, all right? I thought I didn't have one anymore. Okay, so Romans 7 and 5 says, For when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies so that we bore fruit for death. Now, this is a relief again because once again, his wording here is past tense. He says, when we were controlled by the sinful nature, the sinful passions were aroused. Okay, so he's saying it's in our past, so that means that we don't have it anymore, right? It's gone. <laughs> Okay? All right, but then 1 Corinthians 5 and 5, okay? Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about a man who had got involved in some stuff, some, some silly nonsense stuff in the church. He was a member of the church. He was, a, he was a believer, okay? But he got involved in some sexual promiscuity there in the church. And so Paul says, hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Now, now that really confuses me because... Uh, number one, uh, if he's a brother, why does he have a sinful nature? Number two, wasn't it circumcised by Jesus? And number three, why are you turning him over to Satan for? Why would the devil want to destroy someone's sinful nature? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> why would Satan want to help someone get saved? I mean, stuff like that is a little bit confusing. But I want to give you, uh, if, you ha if you've been, if you were at the first class we had on how to study the Bible, you may know where I'm going with this. But for the rest of you, I want to let everyone in, okay? There's a very simple answer and explanation for this tonight. And then here's your explanation. Poor translations. Amen. Poor translations have worded things into Scripture that has caused confusion in the body of Christ. Do you want to know what all of these verses have in common that I read tonight? All of them come from the NIV version. They all come from the NIV, okay? The New International Version. So... I love the NIV. It's one of my favorite Bibles to read, all right? But on this particular phrase, they sort of tied themselves in knots when it came to, to writing about our so-called sinful nature, okay? So let me ask you again. Do we have a sinful nature? No, everybody's afraid to answer. It's all right. I don't blame you, man. When Mark Shell's preaching and he starts asking questions, I'm like, I ain't saying nothing, man. I don't know where you're going with this. <laughs> We don't, okay? We do not have a sinful nature. Now, I'm going to prove it to you, okay? Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, because I'm going to I'm gonna help. I think I'm going to help set you free tonight with some stuff, all right? 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Stacey, have you got it? You want to do some reading? You, you don't have a microphone, I realize, but that's all right. Just read loud. Start at, start at verse 1. 2 Peter 1. 2 Peter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with, with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, hold on. Grace and peace be multiplied to you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You know, grace and peace were given to us, right? They're gifts from God. and they're, they're part of our restored relationship. But he says here it can also be multiplied to us. Now, multiply. How many of you are good at math? I'm not real good at math, but I know the difference between addition and multiplication. Yeah. And when you start multiplying things, you start coming up with a greater sum, don't you? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, one, here's an Old Testament example. One can put a thousand to flight, two, ten thousand. Right. That's not addition, that's multiplication, amen? Right. So it's, it's, it's going over, okay? So he said grace and peace can be multiplied to you. Well, how? How can it be multiplied? Through the knowledge of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. So, yes. so knowledge is key. Understanding is key. Knowing the new covenant, understanding it, and having knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, okay? Yeah. Not a knowledge of good and evil, but a knowledge of God and Jesus Christ, okay? Yeah. All right, pick up at verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 
through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Okay, I've got to stop you for another second. His divine power has given us, past tense, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Thank Amen. Lord. It has. He has already, his divine power, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Once again, how was it? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Yeah. Okay, verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Okay, so we are given exceeding and great precious promises, that by these, by these exceeding and great precious promises, what promises is he talking about? The new covenant. The new covenant that we have in Christ, our inheritance by those we have, have become partakers of the divine nature. So the new covenant, the promises of the new covenant have enabled and empowered us to be partakers of his divine nature. Amen. 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 So we don't have a sinful nature. We have his divine nature. Amen. And we'll get into it a little deeper, right? I haven't sold all of you on it yet. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Having escaped the corruption that is where? In the world. In the world. So there's corruption all around us, right? Amen. Corruption is a part of our life, but it doesn't have to be a part of our nature. Amen. See, it's all around us through, and that, that corruption that is in the world comes through lust, okay? Go ahead, verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Amen. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. All right, so you say, well, Pastor Mark, see, I knew we had to add some stuff to it. You've been telling us it was by faith and not by works. It says here we got to add virtue, we got to add tr uh, trust and add add this stuff to it and brotherly kindness. No, but listen, everything that he says to add, everything here that he's telling us to add just has to do with us <laughs> denying our flesh yeah. flesh nature. Come on now. And, and, and it all ties to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. It says that you may, by adding to these things, by becoming diligent with these things is what he's talking about. By being diligent with these things, you'll neither be barren nor unfruitful. Where? In the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because the knowledge of Jesus Christ, your relationship, your understanding of your relationship with Jesus is what causes you to bear fruit in your life. Yes. Amen. The more you know about your new covenant, the more you know about your restored relationship, about your redeemed innocence, the more you know about what he did for you on Calvary, the more fruit you bear in your life. So he's simply saying, add these things to your, be dil add, add diligence, add virtue, add knowledge, add faith, add temperance or self-control, add patience, add godliness and, and, and kindness and brotherly kindness and charity. He's saying, add these things in your pursuit of knowledge of Jesus Christ. And this is not about trying to attain a status. This is about trying to be diligent to study scripture, diligent to have a relationship with Jesus, diligent to know him. We've been diligent. Some of us haven't even been diligent about knowing the word of the Lord, but there are others that are so diligent about knowing the word of the Lord. They have failed to know the, the Lord of the word. Yeah. And they know the Bible inside and out, but they don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus, though. Okay, and they know Scripture inside and out, but they have no revelation. And the Scripture that they know that they can tout and they can quote four and five chapters at a time off, they have no revelation from it whatsoever. They're simply reading the letter of the law. What this is simply saying is be diligent to maintain your relationship with Jesus Christ because it is what bears fruit in your life. Okay? It's your knowledge of, of your relationship that causes fruit to be born in your life. But he that lacks these things, now I want you to get this because this is important. What things? Everything that we just read. He that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Now there it is right there. You see that? He who lacks these things has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. 
Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never fall. Yes. Amen. You will never fall. Now, I'm not. I'm gonna. I, I'm gonna stop right there. I could give that chapter. It's a good chapter. Um, but I want you to understand that it's it's being diligent to expound on your understanding of the new covenant in your relationship and, and, and intimacy with Jesus on a daily basis. Amen. It's that that causes you to bear the fruit of the new covenant out of your life. And if you don't have a knowledge of it and you don't have an understanding of it, then you're forgetful. James says you're a forgetful hearer. You read Amen. And you look, you read, but you're like a man who looks in a mirror, then walks off and forgets what kind of man he was. So you're looking into the mirror, but you're walking away forgetting that you're a new creation. Forgetting you're new in Christ. Forgetting that you're a son now and no longer a servant. Amen. So you walk away and you forget. Okay. So I want to talk about that for a little bit tonight. All right. How, how to overcome that. In truth, the sinful nature versus the new nature is barely even mentioned in Scripture because it wasn't meant to be a, an outstanding battle in a believer's life, okay? Uh, to say that you got a new nature when you were born again is, is I mean, it's an understatement. It's such an understatement that it's like saying, oh, I, got a, I went and bought a new car and they threw a new steering wheel in, by the way. <laughs> well, of course they did. <laughs> when we were born again, the new nature was just part of the package, amen? It's part of the pack. It's not something that you ascribe to one day have or one day attain. It's something that you got as part of your redemption. Amen? Amen. When you were born again, you didn't just get a new nature. You got a whole new life. Amen. A whole new life. Colossians 2 and 11 says you used to be dead, but now you're alive. Yes. Amen? You used to be one kind of creature, but now you're another. 2 Amen. Corinthians 5, 17 yes. says we're new creatures. Amen? Yes. So what's going on with the verses above that we were reading a while ago, those, those, those verses, not only are they contradictory, but some of them seem to indicate that we have a sinful nature, which we clearly do not have, okay? In five of those, Paul was talking about our flesh, and this is what I'm talking about, okay? Uh, the flesh nature is not the same thing as a sinful nature, okay? And we're, I want to get into this and help you understand something. The, the word for flesh in the Greek is the word sarx, S-A-R-X, okay? The word flesh refers to our physical bodies or our sensual nature. It's that part of us that we would describe as natural as opposed to spiritual, okay? It's the opposite of our spirit, man, okay? Our bodies and our natural senses were given to us by God, and we need them to live, okay? Everything about them really was given to us by God. We need them. There are some scholars and theologians that believe that the, that the flesh is inherently evil. Now listen, if we say that, if we agree with them and we go so far as to say that the flesh is inherently evil, we might as well say Jesus was evil. Because the Bible says that he was made flesh and to live and dwell among us. Amen? Isn't that what John 1.14 says? Alright, so he was made flesh. So Jesus... What I understand, he wasn't, he wasn't technically born under the same type of curse of sin and death that we were because he, he came from heaven. But then on the other sense, he was. He was born of a virgin. He was born into this world as man so that he could be born under everything we were born under and deal with and face everything that you and I have to deal with and face in our lives. He had the full flesh experience. Amen. But he remained without sin. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that everything God made is good, and that includes the flesh. Amen? It does. Now, the problem comes in when we walk after the flesh, when we choose to live in the inferior realm of the flesh rather than the superior realm of the spirit. When we choose to walk after the flesh, then we're, we're letting the flesh. You remember I, a couple Sundays ago when we started this series, I said that when I, my flesh is simply a vehicle that houses my spirit. Amen. When, I walk, when I decide I'm going to walk after my flesh, it's like me going out to my driveway asking my truck where all we're going to go that day. <laughs> asking my truck what he wants to do that day. Where are you going to take me today? What do we want to do? It's silliness when you think about it. But when we let the desires of our flesh lead us through life, 
dictate to us what we're going to do and when we're going to do it and who we're going to do it with, then we're basically letting our flesh, which is only the vehicle, decide our destiny. And it never was anointed to decide destiny. Right. Right. It was only anointed to transfer us from point A to point B, Amen. just to get us around and make us identifiable on this earth. Right. Right. Amen. That's all that it was anointed to do. That's its purpose. Okay. So what we need here, Romans 8 and 5 says when, that we can walk after the old way of the flesh or we can walk after the new way of the spirit. Romans 8 is, is a powerful chapter and it started this whole thing. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Period. At the end of that. And that's another thing we were talking about. Some translations added in there who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. But listen, that was added in. And I have to tell you that there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ, period. At the end of that sentence is a period, okay? You can stumble in your life and you can trip and stumble and get into all kinds of messes. And it does not affect your right standing with God. It cannot and it will not. Amen? Now listen, you can affect every other relationship in your life. And you'll have consequences that you'll have to deal with. But it will not take you out of the hands of Daddy God. Right. It will not take you out of relationship. It will not cut you away from right standing with God. Right. Amen? Yes. Amen? Now listen, most of you are shaking your heads, but I see some of you are struggling with this. And I understand. And it's okay. Let's take a deep breath. And exhale. I struggled with it for a long time as well because what I thought people were trying to tell me was it's all right to go out and do anything I want to do. And that's, that's when you read between the lines, that's what you think grace preachers are saying. When in fact, what they're trying to do is give you the, the, the freedom for the first time in your life. Yes. To set you free, not to live according to religious bondage or live according to the flesh bondage, but to experience freedom the way Christ died to give it to you. Amen. Christ died to give you the ultimate freedom to make you free from the law and free from the flesh. Amen. He, he died to make you totally free. Amen. Lynn Hiles calls it Facebook free. <laughs> he says, I'm free, I'm free, I'm Facebook free. Amen. Some of us don't want to know how free you are, but you put it on Facebook anyway. <laughs> That's, that, that's where he's going with that. Amen. Now, <laughs> I need you to understand that. The, the realm of the flesh is, is real in our lives, but it's inferior to the realm of the spirit. It's inferior in every way, shape, and form, okay? Now, the sinner has no choice in this matter. He remains in the flesh, and flesh is all he knows. All right? But we who have been born of the spirit, we choose. We have the choice whether or not to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. Now, how many of you are with me so far? You understand. You're not confused. You know what I'm saying. Okay. Romans 8 and 5 says that we can walk after the way of the flesh or we can walk after the new way of the spirit. That's why Galatians 5.25 tells us the Bible exhorts those of us who are in the spirit to walk in the spirit. Amen. If we're in the spirit, and we are, let us walk in the spirit. It's basically saying renew your mind and choose to walk the right walk. Amen. Renew your mind and choose to walk the right walk. Put off the old and put on the new. Okay. There's some, there's some verses in Ephesians chapter 4 that I, wanna, that I want you to turn over and look at. Ephesians chapter 4. While you're turning over there, I'll tell you that to choose the way of the flesh is to be... King James Bible calls carnally minded. That's what's in your King James Bible, if that helps make any sense. To be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life. And it goes to say peace as well, right? It's life and peace. Ephesians 4, we've been in Ephesians 4, but for other subjects. But look at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Okay, do you see that right there? So they're walking in the deceit of an unrenewed mind. Okay, they're walking in the vanity and deceit of an unrenewed mind, the other Gentiles were. And he's saying, don't walk like they're walking. They're walking as if they have, they have their understanding darkened 
being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But then he turns it here and he says, but you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Now, man, we could spend the rest of the night right just right there on those few verses. So he's talking about how the Gentiles or the, the, any of them that weren't Jews or Gentiles, by the way, the Greeks, the Romans, all of them, okay? He's saying the ones that have not accepted or believed in Jesus Christ, the ones that have not been saved, are walking in the darkness of their mind. They're being led by a dark mindset and a dark line of thought. Uh, but he said, you haven't learned Christ that way, okay? You have learned something different about Christ. You've learned, amen, that he paid the price on Calvary for your mind to be renewed and restored and redeemed and for you to walk in a right relationship with Jesus Christ again. So he said, that's what you learned from Christ. So take what you've learned from Christ and every day, every day, just rec just don't even give thought to the old man or the old nature anymore. Right, right. Amen. Put your feet on the floor, empowered by the declaration that I am in Christ and he is in me. Amen. I have the mind of Christ. Amen. And renew your mind. Change your mind. Let it get in there. Let scripture get in there. Renew your mind and think differently about your right standing with God. Amen. 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 It's not works based. Hallelujah. It's about the finished work. Yes. Amen. All right. Carnal mindedness for the born again believer, the spiritual believer. It's a choice, not a condition. Okay. I want you to understand that it's a choice, not a condition. And it's a choice that runs contrary to our new nature. It runs contrary to the new nature that we have. All right. I get into this. I mean, you guys, I've got into all kinds of stuff the last few weeks. So there are a lot of people in society today. Christians and non-Christians that believe that the desires they have have to have been given to them by God. And so they, I'm going to chase after these desires because they had to have been put there by God. Otherwise, I wouldn't have them. Right. That's not the truth. Amen. That is not the truth. There is a host of reasons why people have certain tendencies and certain desires. And if we had time, we could get into it and address every one of them. And maybe in another setting, I will, okay? Because I want you to understand that. But we cannot let desires of the flesh and cravings of the flesh dictate how we're going to walk. Right. We cannot let it do it, okay? And so you say, well, what do, what's the answer then? What's the answer? Well, the answer is not condemning people to hell. I'll tell you that right now. The answer is not in telling people turn or burn. That's not going to save anyone, okay? That's going to just introduce a hateful, vengeful God to them that they are already running from anyway. And he's not like that anyway, amen? You might be like that, but he's not like that. Amen? He's not like that. He's loving in his nature. He's forgiving. He's accepting. He takes people just like they are, saves them. Amen. Who are we to say, if you get up after you ask the, the Lord Jesus into your heart and you get up and you go do this again, you never got saved. Who are we to say that? Amen. Who are we to say that? Amen. <laughs> it's spiritual arrogance that borders, that borders on what the Pharisees used to say and the Sadducees. By telling people that, uh, that, that if you're still struggling with all that stuff, you need to get down and pray again because you didn't get it right the first time. Right, right. My God, as if we can actually get it right or wrong. Amen. Right. It was all about what he did right, not about what we do wrong or right. Amen. It's about believing in Jesus Christ. And you say, well, okay, well, what about these desires? Okay, well, let's just be honest tonight. We all have desires. We all have them creep up. We all have them creep in. We all find ourselves in situations where we're exposed to certain things. And, 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 and the Bible said, James, as a matter of fact, said that desire uh, begins in your life by lust. And then it produces, uh, does it produces what does it say, James? Desire produces, somebody tell me out. 
sin gives birth to death. Okay, so lust produces desire. Desire produces sin. Sin gives birth to death in our life. So there's a, there's a, a, a step there, a regressive course of action that takes place when you consistently walk after the flesh. When you consistently walk after the flesh, okay? But that's not what, how we've learned Jesus Christ. And that's not now, and the people that don't know that yet need to be taught right. They need to be taught right, okay? It's not about casting demons out either. Yeah. That's right. I'll just say that. I believe in deliverance, and I've done it before. But it's not about laying hands on someone and casting some kind of devil out of them Come to fix now. them, okay? Right, it's about renewing their mind yeah. and amen. helping them amen. understand their true identity, oh, their real okay. identity. So carnal mindedness for the believer is a choice, not a condition. And it's a choice that runs contrary to our new nature. Verse 1 in the list, the first verse that we shared in the list tonight, it said that, uh, the, it used the word sinful nature, but it wasn't referring to the flesh, uh, but it was referring to the body of sin or the body of the sins of the flesh that Jesus cut away from us. It, it, when it talked about the, the very first one that we shared was Colossians 2 and 11. In him you were also circumcised and putting off the sinful nature not with circumcision. So it's talking about that body of sin that the Lord Jesus cut off of us, okay? That's what that one is talking about. But in, in most cases, it's the word flesh that has been misinterpreted or mistranslated. And so they've inserted sinful nature in there, okay? And, and in Romans 6 and 6, Paul says, you were a slave to sin, but no more. Amen. Amen. No more, okay? And even the NIV Bible is really plain about this. It says several times in Romans chapter 6, you have been freed from sin. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Three times in Romans chapter 6, it makes that statement, you have been freed from sin. Romans 6 and 7, 6 and 18, and 6 and 22. Three times. Now that's wonderful news. Yes. We've been freed from sin. Amen. When we were in the flesh, we weren't free to choose. But now that you're in the spirit, you are. You're free to choose. Amen. Before you were born again, you were not free to choose. But now that you're in the spirit, you're free to choose. So the question comes up, and it's a logical question. Well, why do I still sin then sometimes? All right. And let me just tell you that you're from time to time, you're going to sin, and you might find yourself wondering, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Okay. And, and if you read certain passages in the NIV, you might conclude it's because you still have a sinful nature that rises up every now and then. Now listen, we talked about this three weeks ago. And I'll tell you again, it, every time something rises up in you and you give in to a craving or a desire, it's not Adam being raised from the dead. Amen. Okay? We, it's not. Okay, let's leave him dead. Yeah. I said this the other day. We have more faith in the resurrection of Adam than we do the resurrection of Christ. Yeah. We'll raise Adam up every few days in our life and we'll blame That's stuff on him. He's dead. Leave him dead. Yeah. Reckon him to be dead. Okay? Yes. You have a new life now. You're alive. You're, you're dead and you're alive in Christ yeah. now. Okay? Yeah. Amen. You're a new creature, a new creation. And you might think you're hardwired to sin and that you need to die to yourself daily. And there are other verses. We're going to keep talking about these verses. There are lots of verses that seem to contradict. And what I want to do for the next few Wednesday nights is tackle these tough verses. All right. Elizabeth asked me a question Sunday night at Cell Group. And, and her question was, what if works has nothing to do with and, and she wasn't asking because she was necessarily disagreeing, but she was confused. She said, if works has nothing to do with salvation, then why did Paul say work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? That is a good question, and I sent her a wonderful response the next day. Uh, and what I want to do, though, is tackle verse by verse. I want to deal with some of these verses over the next few weeks to help us get our mind wrapped around them and understand them, okay? You're not, listen, okay? You might think you're hardwired to sin, but you're not. You're not, okay? It's not true. You died already. You're not a saint with a sinful nature. You are not a saint with a sinful nature any more than you are a reformed sinner. Amen. You're a new creature. A new creature. All right. You need to read what the Bible says about you and you need to know what it says about you. You're a completely new creation with new desires. We sin because we sometimes choose to walk by sight and not by faith. That's right. And we're led by, we choose to be led by our senses. And when we do, it leads us into trouble. Amen? Okay. Romans 14 and 23, by the way, is where that's found. 
We might do it out of habit. I'm going to tell you some reasons. We might do it out of habit. We might do it out of ignorance. But when we set our minds on inferior earthly things and we indulge in the lust of the flesh, I will tell you this, it is out of character. It is completely out of character for you and your new identity. Amen. 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 Now, you need to get that. Okay? That bears worth, that's, that's worthy of repeating. All right? Yeah. Whenever you do begin to walk after the flesh and you find yourself doing things that are contrary to the, to the this new nature, the new creature, amen, of being spiritually minded, whenever you do fulfill the lust of the flesh, you have to go, you have to step outside of character to do it and to go against your nature. Amen. You have to, okay? So we're ba basically, it could even be said that when you go out and do things that are sinful like that, you're actually being hypocritical because you're doing things that are contrary to your nature. Now you thought it was the other way. <laughs> we, we've been told all these years if we did stuff and still came to church, we were a hypocrite. Now listen, amen. We're, if you're still having trouble doing stuff, you need to be in church. You need to be pressing into God. The reason why the blood of Jesus purged our conscience was not so we could hide in the leaves and trees anymore. It was not so we could run from God. It was so we could run to God. Amen. And boldly approach the throne of grace in time of need. Amen. That's what sets us free is the presence of God. And when you get in the presence of God more and more, over and over again, stuff starts dropping off you. It starts falling off of you and you start losing the old desires that you once had and the things that you're struggling with now, you might not even be struggling with a few, a few months from now. Amen. It might, you might not even remember those days anymore. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Now, <laughs> the, the, new, the new international version, by the way, the NIV went back in 2011 and made a bunch of changes to the NIV Bible. So from that point on, all of them that are going to be released have corrected that. And they now say flesh instead of carnal nature or, or sinful nature. Okay. But <laughs> there's a but. Old habits die hard because in the in the commentary in that Bible, they still say this. In the note in the commentary, the translators, they qualify making that change by saying, in context like this, the Greek word for flesh refers to the sinful state of human beings. So what they've done was they changed it from sinful nature to sinful state. Big difference. Huh? <laughs> Amen. Big improvement. <laughs> All right, here's the thing. So we've got, so according to the NIV translator, we've gone from having a sinful nature to living in a sinful state. All right, and it just, my earlier point bears repeating. If the flesh is inherently sinful, then Jesus was too. Amen. But it is not, and neither was he. Amen. It is not, and neither was he. Amen. Now, I want you to read that verse again, as a matter of fact, because that verse says, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord. Romans 13 and 14. Romans 14, 13 and 14 says, Rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay? Look, now if you look, this is where Revelation comes in handy, okay? If you look at it, you see here that what the real problem is in the verse is not the flesh, but it's you thinking about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. That's what the verse plainly said. When we sit around and we begin to think on how to gratify or satisfy the desires of the flesh, then a problem enters in. Yeah. Amen? Because we begin thinking on things, we begin meditating on things, and what you allow to take up space in your mind begins to take up space in your heart. That's right. That's Amen? Right. And what takes up space in your mind and your heart finds its way manifesting out of your life. That's right. Okay? So that's the, that's the thing right there, okay? Most of our problems originate with unrenewed thinking, all right? Not, not, the, not the flesh, not the corruptible flesh, but it, they originate with an unrenewed mind. An unrenewed mind, okay? So give me just a few more minutes. I want to talk about renewing our mind for just, just a couple of minutes, okay? And uh, Psalms chapter 98 was a verse that came up this morning at Bible study. And it was a verse I brought up a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning as well. And as Jane might not have even been here that Sunday morning when I brought it up, but uh, I, I, I was reading out of Psalm 98 and 1, and we were just starting the service off with prayer one morning. 
just up here just decreeing scripture, starting off with prayer. And I said, oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. Yes. His right hand and his holy arm have gained the victory for him. Yes. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Now, while I was just decreeing that and declaring that, the revelation hit me just like a ton of bricks. And it said, it said, sing to the Lord a new song for he has done wonderful things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. And all of a sudden it hit me. Wait a minute. God needed victory? When, at what point did God ever need victory in his life? And I realized it was when you and I were separated from him. When you and I were separated from him, he loved us so much that he needed a victory. And, his, and so he stretched out his right arm, Jesus Christ, his left arm, the Holy Spirit. And the two of them together worked with him in the plan of redemption to gain him the victory. What was the victory, you say? The victory was restoring you back to the Father again. Restoring you back to relationship with God was God's victory, and it was God's salvation manifested and made known to the entire world. Amen? Amen. That's why Acts 1 and 8, when it says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that word power, when you really dig deep into it, what it's talking about is relationship. Yes. You shall receive relationship because our power comes from our relationship with God. The Holy Spirit came to restore that relationship. We say sometimes, thank you for the gift of Jesus, but Jesus wasn't the gift. Jesus was the price paid for the gift. Wow. The Holy Spirit was the gift because the Holy Spirit was the Spirit of God. The work of restoration and redemption that he did was so powerful. Amen. He didn't just restore. He told the thief on the cross when he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. But I want you to understand something, man. And I'm working on a message right now that I'm going to break out in a few weeks. But um, I, I want you to understand something. He restored us to paradise, but it wasn't just a place that he restored us to. In fact, I want to propose something to you. I believe that the paradise is you and I. He restored us by making us paradise again because what makes us paradise is God moving into our house. Hallelujah. He moved into our house Amen. and restored us to right standing with him again. Amen. So if you want paradise in your life, begin manifesting out of you the God that lives on the inside of you. Amen. He lives in you. Amen. I went to church last night up in Moore and I had this thought on my mind as I was, as I all the way up there, I was thinking about this song that used to say that uh, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And it's a psalm, and I realize that it's a quote from scripture. But I was sitting there quietly thinking to myself, you know, Lord, we're the gate. We're the door. We're the court. We're the tabernacle. In the Old Testament, there was the tabernacle, then there was the temple. You, you with me? Yeah. There was the temple of David. But the Bible says in the New Covenant now that know ye not that you're the temple of the Holy yes. Spirit, you are now his habitation. Yes, we are. He lives in us. Hallelujah. Amen. The feast of Passover was about salvation. The feast of Pentecost was about the Holy Spirit being poured out. The feast of tabernacles is that is that age that the earth is about to step into because of the body of Christ. And it's that age that has to do with the fullness of God's presence living in man living in man the glory of god manifesting from us in us through us amen so we are he remembered them all right he put them back into the paradise but he also began to turn man into paradise by tabernacling by choosing to tabernacle with man amen it's, it's a powerful thing oh you're thinking now everybody's afraid to amen because you're thinking about it. it's an exciting time that we're looking at right now on planet earth i'm going to tell you why and i'm going to wrap this up in just a couple minutes here but it's an exciting time because we're beginning the celebration it's been it's been two days since jesus was on the planet since he went back home two thousand years two days same thing to god right okay we're about to begin a third day and the first day was symbolic of passover the second day was symbolic of pentecost and I know that because Passover literally happened at the beginning of the first day. At the beginning of the second day, what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out on earth again 
was renewed, restored the gifts of the Spirit. It was symbolic of that day or that thousand-year span of Pentecost. And we're about to begin a thousand-year span known as the millennial reign, if you will, of Christ on earth. The fullness of God's presence manifesting through his people on earth. Amen. It never has been about getting raptured out of here. It's always been about possessing the earth for the kingdom. Occupying, establishing his kingdom here on earth. Amen. So that we can manifest the glory right here on this place. Amen. Take over this place. Amen. Hallelujah. I, I hate to break it to you, but the only rescue plan that's coming down the pipe came on Calvary already. And there's no more rescue plan coming our way. We are to occupy till he comes. And we're to manifest him on this earth. Amen. So he didn't just put us back in paradise when he restored us. In other words, he didn't just take us into a place. He made us into a place. Amen. 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 He didn't just take us into a place. He made us into a place. Now, he set it up so the Father could move into us and make his dwelling in us. And it took the Son and the Spirit working together to make us a habitation for God again. Amen. So he set it up so that now heaven isn't just a place we go, it's a place we show. Amen. So I'm no longer worried about going to heaven. Heaven is here. The kingdom is here. Amen. The glory of God is here. So now I'm manifesting. I'm showing what he has done. Amen. Amen. Psalm 24 says, lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up, yeah. you everlasting doors. And what does it say will happen? It says the king of glory will come in. Well, the lifting of the heads and the gates is talking about us renewing our minds. Amen. Amen. So I want to propose to you that the lifting of the head speaks of the renewing of the mind. He calls us gates. He calls us doors, and he says, renew your mind, and the king of glory will appear through you. Amen. Renew your mind, and the king of glory will appear through you. So that's the stuff that I was thinking on on the way to church last night. I showed up. I showed up. Mark Shell, I, I kid you not, half of you were there, you know. So we get there, and Mark Shell's preaching out of 2 Kings chapter 4. And can I just share this with you? And then we'll, then we'll just let you go. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. I can't lay claim to this. This was all him, all right? Even though it's the same thing that I was thinking. 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Now it happened one day that Elisha went to Shunem, where there was a notable woman. And she persuaded him to eat some food. And so it was as often as he passed by, he would turn in there to eat some food. And she said to her husband, look now. I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Please let us make a small upper room on the wall and let us put a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. So it will be whenever he comes to us, he can turn in there. What he was sharing with us last night is what the notable woman stood for. And he said that the upper room, are you ready for this? The upper room is a renewed mind. Yes. Now the prophet represented the glory of God. The prophet was represented the mouthpiece or the spokesperson or the glory of God. So the renewed mind decides to make a habitation for the glory of God. Amen. Are you going with me? <laughs> the renewed mind makes an upper room, a habitation for the glory of God to pass by regularly. But look at your neighbor and say, it's not just passing by now. He lives in us. Amen. The, and he put some things. There, there are five things. Number one was the upper room, okay? The renewed mind. Romans 12 and 2 says, renew your mind so that you can prove God's will. Uh, number two, he put a bed in there. The bed represents a place of rest. A place of rest. Hebrews 4 and 10 says that, that we have to enter into the, there remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. And the rest is not a promised land. It's a promised land. That's not a place. It's a person. Jesus Christ, okay? So he put a bed in there. He put a table in there. And a table is a place of communion. A table is the, the place of communion is where we feed off the finished work of the cross. Amen. First Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, talk about communion. It's about feeding off the finished work of the cross. The fourth thing was the chair, which speaks of a seated position, being given a position. Ephesians 2 and 6 says that we have been raised together with Christ and seated in the heavenly places. Amen. Okay, and the number five was the lampstand, which represents revelation. Revelation. Now the church is the light of the world, and the lampstand in the rev and the church is the lampstand or the revelation to the world of Jesus Christ. 
Because in the book of Revelation, when John turned to hear the voice behind him, he saw a lampstand, and he saw one standing in the midst of the lampstand. And, the, and that one told him that the lampstand was the church, okay? The lampstand was a church, but guess who was in the center of his church? Christ was. He was in the center of his church. So the, the now Ephesians, if I'm not mistaken, says that he will, by the church, reveal his manifold That's wisdom right. to the world. Church, yeah. Amen? He will. Amen. That's what he said. All right. So the lampstand of Revelation. So Revelation is what allows the church to reveal Jesus Christ to the world. Now, this is just on the way home. I was thinking about this, and I thought five is the number of grace in Scripture. Amen? Five is the number of grace in Scripture. And, and five things are needed for the glory to fully manifest in your house. In your house, a renewed mind, resting in faith, a finished work, a place of communion, and being seated in the heavenly places with the light of revelation. Amen? The, re the renewed mind has the pieces of furniture in it. And he made this statement last night. I started to put it on Facebook today, but it was so deep, nobody would have got it unless they heard the message. And he said, as long as you are still serving Christ, or, or living for Christ, that's what he said, as long as you are still living for Christ, it means your house is not furnished enough for you to live as Christ. You're living for him because you haven't put all the furniture in place to live as him yet. Amen. Now, I got it when he said it. It made sense to me. And I realized that we're busy as Christians with all sorts of activities trying to live for him. Amen. But when we get the furnishings in place, the renewed mind, the place of rest, the place of communion, the revelation of the seated position. Amen. And then the, the revelation, the light. When we get those furnishings in place in our house, we're no longer trying to live for him. We start living as him. Because Colossians says our life is dead and hid. We're, we are dead and our life is hid with Christ in God. Amen. Yes, amen. amen. So amen. that's what the world's waiting to see. Yes, that's the manifestation yes. of sons that the world's waiting to see. Yes. And it starts with a renewed mind. Yes. It starts with a renewed mind. Yes, understanding yes, the finished work. Amen. amen. And understanding when you have a renewed mind, you don't forget what manner of man or woman you are. Amen. But you know that you're a new creature. Amen. You know that you have, or you're partakers of his divine nature. Yes. And you don't get up every day wondering if the sinful nature is going to rise up that day and have its way because you know that thing is dead. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Let's stand up together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is amazing. He's doing amazing things in the body of Christ. And what he's doing in the Grace Center is just part of what he's doing in Oklahoma. It's part of what he's doing in Shawnee, what he's doing in Oklahoma, what he's doing around Shawnee and other churches.